drag strip mode is enabled. Launching. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> okay. So the 2021 Model S Long Range is here, and between this and the Plaid, I think the Long Range is the one that most people are going to get. So here are 50 plus things everyone needs to know about the 2021 Tesla Model S Long Range. So I think the biggest change in a car, a lot of changes, and maybe the, one of the coolest things or the biggest cause for concern, depending on what your camp you're in, uh, is the yoke steering wheel. I'm somebody who generally drives with my hand at like one o'clock. So this was a very different feel for me. It is wide and thick. So when you're holding it down here, it does feel really solid and grounded. Uh, holding it up top does feel nice as well. Tesla positioned the armrest pretty well too, so you can rest your arm and easily hold onto it one-handed. While you're going straight. When you have to turn, I think that's where things start to become a little bit different, especially when you're doing a three-point turn. When the wheel is straight up and down, the only place to hold it is up here, and that's where the thickness kind of becomes, I think, a little bit problematic, is your whole hand is gripping it. It's different holding it like this than I think it is holding it like this, and then you have to come back and grab it from here to do a turn. It's obviously possible, and you would get used to it over time. Uh, it's definitely different and I think in the case of an emergency where you gotta make a quick turn, it potentially become problematic and maybe even a bit of a safety hazard. Keeping sure with things being unconventional, there's no stocks here. So the turn signals have moved to the wheel and this seems reversed to me, but you've got the right one up top and the left one down below. If you tap it, quick tap, it'll do just a you know one, two, three, or you hold it down, you do get haptic feedback and then it'll sort of stay on and you can tap it again to let it go away. It actually does work very well. It's more of a muscle memory thing of getting used to left being on the bottom. I thought that I was gonna have a big issue with that, but honestly, I got used to it pretty quickly. I prefer a stock, but I didn't mind how Tesla has it set up. Also on the screen are your wiper settings and your voice activation buttons, as well as your headlight controls. If there's one issue with the car that I think I find most problematic safety-wise, it's that this does nothing. Uh, the horn is a button. Now it works if you tap it. Obviously the horn sound goes. Well, according to Tesla's user manual, you can place your whole hand over the right side of the yoke and that will activate the horn. We didn't know that in our time with the car, so we asked a friend of the channel, MKBHD Marquez Bramley, to test it on his Model S Plaid, and this is what he had to say. So without the right stock, Obviously changing gears is different, we'll talk about that. But turning on autopilot is different as well. You now push in the right scroll wheel twice to activate autopilot. So one of the pros of the yoke steering wheel that, that Elon and Tesla were talking about when they announced this was visibility. Uh, so first, forward visibility to see out, there's nothing obstructing you, but also visibility now on this front screen. You don't have to look through anything to see it. And mission accomplished here, visibility is absolutely amazing. I can see out perfectly and I have a clear unobstructed view of this screen uh, in front of me. So visibility is absolutely awesome. The rest of the visibility of the car is exactly what you'd expect from any Model S you may have driven before. Uh, no difference at all there. So another question that people were asking was, is the yoke heated? Uh, yes, it is. And it's controlled via the touchscreen. Shifting gears is, is weird in the new cars. So there's a beta feature that'll shift it for you using sort of Tesla vision. Uh, and the idea behind that is they use cameras, it'll know where you wanna go and it will shift. And in practice, it's actually worked relatively well. It's known whether or not I wanna go forward or back depending on how I came into the park parking spot. It'll detect pretty well if I'm in a garage. And obviously if I went forward, I was gonna hit something. It would know to back up. Uh, that's not the only way to shift gears. Since in beta, maybe you don't wanna use it. You have a few other ways to go about it. So if you swipe in from the side on the screen here, you can actually put it in drive by going up or put it in reverse by scrolling down. And then once you're in gear, park will show up top, you push park and there is your parking brake. Uh, also for redundancy, in case something happens to the screen, down here by the charger, kind of tough to get them to light up, but there are gear selectors there as well that you can press and control uh, which gear you wanna go into. So in early testing, 
the auto shift has worked well, um, but I do wanna demonstrate it for you in different scenarios, with cars in front, with people, so at least you can get a sense of how well it works right now, kind of its first beta release. And then this auto shift is coming uh, to Model 3 and Model Y, so this is gonna be applicable to most of Tesla's new cars. So, just for illustration purposes, there's a person standing behind the car, and there's a car in front of us. So, let's see what the car's gonna do. So it's still telling us to go into reverse. Let's see if it actually will move. I'll try to be very cautious here. Uh, all right, so it's still gonna move. The moral here is that with all the cameras, you still need to be paying attention. Clearly it's beta here. There should have been some sort of warning to say obstacle behind you, person detected or something. So not a perfect system. You still need to be paying attention. All right, so that's the yoke and the auto shift. Uh, honestly, it's better than I expected it to be, uh, but certainly it's not a, a perfect driving tool. So while having a secondary display in the Model S is not new, uh, what it shows, and it's new with the UI. So let me show you a little bit about what it can do. Obviously, it'll show you which way you're going um, when you have the auto park on. It'll show you your speed. That is all things you can expect. Push that and drive and we are off. Visualizations though are, uh, are new here. So if I've got navigation on, let's say I'm gonna to navigate to Disneyland. One of my favorite features about it though, and this has sort of been in the S and the X before, is that you'll get your navigation instructions on the screen in front of you. Now you also get it on the 17 inch screen, but you've got it sort of in front of you as well, which is really helpful. All right, so uh, this clip got a lot of attention. Let's test the three-pointer and see if that was sort of accurate or sensationalized. I mean, that was really no different than having a regular wheel. The only thing that was different about it was where my hands were being held. So the three-point turn controversy, I think, was blown way out of proportion. So driving the car feels really good. The Model S I thought was always a really good driving car. Uh, I'm coming from Model 3, so I'm noticing the air suspension here, but it's probably not unique to this one. It's probably true with, with any uh, of the Model S's. So the long range version starts in the mid to high 80s. I think the Plaid one gets all sort of the, the headlines for its speed, but the long range one has a zero to 60 time of 3.1 seconds, which is the exact same zero to 60 as a performance three. So this car is, is no uh, slouch at all when it comes to speed. So even now, just going from, I mean, we're throwing, we're throwing people back. Uh, also, kind of interestingly enough, this comes with launch mode, so kind of the cheetah mode where it lowers the front and raises the back. So from a stop, you can still throw this guy. This car feels stupidly fast. Uh, I've never driven a Plaid one, so I can't speak what that sounds like. But again, somebody who drives a Performance 3, this car feels faster than that uh, because it's bigger. This car is fast. This car is crazy fast. Uh, and also, you are saving a ton of money not going Plaid, which has 0-60 to 60 time of sub 2 seconds, about 1.9. So, just insanely quick. But, because I feel like we should, let's try launch mode. Drag strip mode, it's enabled. Launching. Three. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, okay. I mean, I don't know what plaid feels like, but that was, that was insanely quick. Ooh. Hey! Uh, but overall driving is, is really good. Um, you get all the stuff you'd expect from the Model S that's been here before. Geolocation for suspension, if you like to raise it or lower it, depending on certain spots. Um, but it's a Model S, just looks different inside, and it drives like one. Uh, a very, very, very uh, fast one. So unlike the new 3s and Ys that are relying totally on Tesla Vision, so just cameras, right now at least the S and the X do still have uh, the radar. Who knows for how much longer, uh, but they are at least still here. The next thing I want to talk about is the 17 inch screen and the new UI. There's been some thought that the screen actually might rotate. As of right now, it does not. There's been some rumors though that perhaps a software update could enable some sort of power rotation here, but right now, 
uh, it is fixed inside of this area. So this thing is being powered by like a PlayStation 5 level uh, processor. It's AMD. Things feel crazy fast. I never felt any of the processing in the 3 and the Y felt slow, um, but just everything here is insanely quick. So speed, like this car and as fast as it goes 0 to 60, is not an issue. Uh, but now they have kind of widgets where things can be moved around. It's a new UI. You've got customization options that you didn't have before. So the first thing, it's swiping from the side and you get all of your quick controls, including the gear selector shows up there and a bunch of stuff that you can do here, recording, sentry, control, uh, steering wheel and cameras, or I guess the yoke and cameras. Tap the screen and that will go away. So down here is the dock. And now finally the dock is customizable. So if you go ahead and hit those three dots, you've got essentially the icons that you can use to customize and what you want to pull in here. So let's say I want to bring Spotify in. You can go ahead and long press. This is very similar to anybody who's ever used a smartphone. Drag it in, an X will show up above if you want to get rid of something, and you could drag it away. That's awesome, very customizable. If I go ahead and launch something like Spotify, for example, this is a familiar UI. You can obviously do the same thing you did before. You could minimize it, make it smaller. But now you've got the ability to sort of move widgets around. And this is sort of where the UI can be awesome and problematic. It's not intuitive how that works. Sometimes you can drag it down and try to move it and it'll work. Sometimes it won't work. You can see right there. And then you can go ahead and put it on the side. I'm not sure if I can even resize this. I can't find a way to sort of make this smaller if I wanted more of the map. It, it may be there, but again, as it stands right now, a bit unintuitive. Obviously, that can be fixed with software. And sometimes things are a bit inconsistent, too. Occasionally, there'll be an icon that'll show up that you can switch with on the left and the right. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. And this just went smaller, and I can go ahead and still move it to the side. So it works well, a bit unintuitive sometimes with what you can do and where, but I imagine that will get fine-tuned. So I've seen some confusion about what apps are here in the dock, so let me just show you. Um, you've got calendar, messages, Bluetooth, tune in, radio, and then theater, arcade, toy box, and browser. In addition to phone, Spotify, you've got all of your music and cameras, and that's all you are going to have down here. Then you can customize, again, what shows up inside of that dock. Uh, there has been some questions also about what sources you're going to have uh, when it comes to radio and streaming. So here are your streaming choices. Uh, what's not here though is satellite radio. So if I go click on radio, this is just regular FM radio. No AM radio here either, but that's kind of been a standard uh, on Tesla's for a while. So if you're hoping for satellite radio, disappointed or hoping for Apple Music, both of those are not here. So when this was uh, announced, Elon was showing Cyberpunk on here. So the games that are in here are the exact same games in the arcade that are in the rest of the Tesla cars. There's nothing unique here or, or new that's not in other cars. No sort of AAA titles here. You're not gonna have Cyberpunk built in. Perhaps that will come, maybe it'll be an app store, but at least as of right now, it is not here. And it's the same for everything else as well. If you go to the theater, it's the same theater apps that are on the rest of the cars. Toy Box is the same as well. And of course the browser is the same as it has been. Well, a 17 inch screen gives a ton of customization. Uh, there's not much you can do though with the front display, at least not yet. So these two screens are not the only screens in the car. There's also a new one in the back. Let me show you what it can do. So I think people have been clamoring for a, a rear display in Tesla's for a while, and they've answered it with this eight inch display here. So let me show you what's here and what it can do. So you've got full climate control back here, which is obviously awesome. You've got full music control back here, which is great. This music is the same as what's going to be playing from the front. Um, you can direct where the fans go. It's the same sort of blade of air that we've got now in the front. We've had in the three and the Y for years. Control your seat heaters from here. Control your volume from here. And then you've got the same sort of, I guess, movie sources or media sources uh, that you've got in the front. Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, and Twitch. Obviously the back screen can control the content that's here, but also it can be controlled from the front screen. If I select something to play on there, um, I'll get a little icon here letting me know what's going on. So I have Netflix playing on the front screen. I can tap it, it'll take me right in and mirror what's going on. Then when I wanna drive, it'll turn that screen off and keep the content playing uh, back here. The biggest question that I had was, can people in the back watch something while you're driving? Uh, and the answer is yes, you can. I could watch any of these things while the person in front was driving. 
So we wanted to try Bluetooth headphones to see if someone in the back could watch content while people in the front could listen to something different just through the speakers. Uh, and I couldn't get that to work. Maybe that's something that we couldn't figure out, uh, but it wasn't working here. And that sort of encompasses the experience. It's inconsistent what does things and, and doesn't do things back here. Um, so we can watch any of this stuff, but it's going to play on all the speakers. I can control the AC, obviously, from here, but from the front, they can only control what turns it on or off. They can't control the flow of air at all. And as far as what's playing in the front and back, it seems like I think it's playing across all of the speakers, regardless of whether you choose it on the 17-inch display or the 8-inch one in the back. But you can definitely watch stuff. It works while you're driving, and your kids or passengers can chill with YouTube or Netflix while you're on a long road trip. So I thought it would have been cool to see if you could use a rear screen for games. Um, you can't right now. Whatever's playing in the front is not going to show here. This is really the only options that you've got are these four things for, for media. Um, but while a game is playing there, I could watch YouTube. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna let you still play the game, but the audio from YouTube is gonna take over the audio from the front. Again, things work, but it is kind of inconsistent with what's working and where audio is going to come from for different things. And to control here, much like most touchscreen devices without a home button, um, you just give a swipe to get back home. So obviously the fan controls here are the same blades of air that we've got in the front, uh, which is awesome. In my seating position, and I'm not super tall, I'm 5'9", the blades of air are only coming right out of here, the center console. So if I push it all the way to the side and up, or at least where it would kind of hit me in the face, it doesn't. Uh, the farthest I can feel it is kind of hitting my knee. It's not going to hit the person who's sitting here, something at least to, to know. So the screen is not going to move. Again, maybe it will with the software update. I doubt it though, it seems pretty fixed. Also, if you are seat belted in and it's tight, I mean, I can't reach out. If you can certainly lean forward with your belt on though uh, and be able to touch and do whatever you want. Uh, other question I had was visibility. You know, you're sitting back here chilling, watching YouTube on a drive. Uh, it's strange that it's positioned down low instead of most center displays are usually sort of up on the roof or behind a headrest. It's weirdly placed, but it didn't bother me. I mean, looking down is, is fine. I think on a long road trip, it wouldn't have any impact on like my neck. I don't think I would get nauseous. Um, totally fine. So a ton of changes obviously inside the car, uh, but there are changes on the exterior as well. Uh, I've got a revised front fascia here. It gives it a bit more of an aggressive stance. Coming around the side though, you can start to see I think the bigger differences. So I'm not gonna call it a chrome delete. We've got black trim now everywhere. We sort of saw this start with the Model Y and then filter its way all the way down. I think it looks absolutely awesome seeing it all the way across here. Materials here on the door handle also are different than what we had before. They used to be just a shiny metal and they got crazy hot. I don't know what the material is here, but they don't get as hot. You can see it right now. It's 90 degrees and we're in the sun. This would have been baking on the old Model S. Black trim comes all the way down uh, and also is in the back now, even all the way down to the Tesla uh, name. What's interesting though is there's no badging here letting you know this is the long range version. Uh, it appears only the plaid is going to have the plaid badging here. Uh, some slight changes down here uh, on the back as well. Again, giving a bit more of an aggressive look. And you've got slightly more flared, flarier um, on the back here uh, as well. Big question that I had, especially of a car that costs as much, is build quality. Tesla's been known for panel gaps, sort of some substandard uh, build quality. I have not seen any egregious panel gaps on this particular car at all. And again, this is just one example. I haven't seen any others that come off the assembly line. This looks very tightly put together. So despite it not being the configurator, I've seen some people ask questions if this is a sliding roof, giving you kind of a sunroof option. It's not. It's one piece of glass. Uh, also, there's no divider across the middle here. So one straight piece, and I think it looks awesome. Other things that are new here are adaptive headlights, and they'll move as you turn the wheel. Some rumors are saying that maybe there's laser headlights in there haven't been turned on yet because of legalities here in the US, but totally unsubstantiated. Model S and Model X were always expensive, but the interior of them never really matched the price. This is a completely redone interior with new materials, and it feels much better absolutely everywhere, from the wood trim 
to even just the sliding mechanisms, things feel better. There's a new material here kind of covering the speakers on the side door panel that's kind of like a mesh. It feels good. The panels here, the sort of soft touch vegan leather feels nice. You've got that suede-esque headliner here. Even up top, you're hard pressed to find many uh, of the hard plastics that you used to be able to find in the old cars. It doesn't feel like a premium car. It's not competing with, say, a S-Class or something, but definitely feels more premium than the interiors have felt before. And that is a huge step forward. Wireless chargers are new here on the S, uh, and they're big, way bigger than what's in the 3 and the Y. I've got an iPhone 12 Pro Max. I could fit it here easily, and I could even fit it in if I had a case on it, which is something that's pretty new. They work, they'll charge your phones via Qi wireless charging. Uh, it's awesome. Interior-wise, also things are different, not just the materials, even things down to the cup holders are different. So the cup holders will slide out, they'll go back. There's a huge interior storage bin here. You can push that, you'll get access to a little sliding storage. You can push that forward if you want. And then this can stop, give you access, or push it again, it'll come all the way forward. This opens up another huge storage bin down in there with a light. Ventilated seats are here, at least back, uh, and it's awesome to have them, and they work really well. They had them for like a hot second on the Model X. And you access them kind of the way you'd expect. You can hit climate, and then you get full control over your seats here. You can pick whether or not you want to heat or cool them, and they work just like the heated seats, except the opposite. Uh, and they do work really well. I'm actually really impressed with how well the cooled seats work. I've had them on the whole time we've been filming here. It's 90 degrees out, uh, and they feel great, and I think they actually look great too. So finally making its way to uh, the S and the X, you now can use your phone as a key, which is awesome, which means you're also going to get uh, the NFC cards. To do it, if you want to use those, you actually hold it on the left uh, phone charger and that would work. But also, you get actual key fobs too, which you can use and you sort of tap them there if you're not using your phone. So I drove one of the original Model S's and I drove a Model X for three years. I love both of those cars, but wind noise was really loud. Tesla did not do a great job with insulation or noise canceling. Uh, not so with the new one. The noise canceling and the insulation uh, is awesome. So the best way I can demonstrate it on video is to play music outside. At least loud so you can hear it. And then just roll up the windows. I mean, it's like somebody hit mute and you can, you can't hear anything. And that translates to road noise as well. You don't hear the electric motor whirl or hum. You don't hear anything on the outside. All you hear is AC noise and the person sitting next to you. So new to the S and the X, but not new to three and the Y is this camera right here. That can be used for a few things. Uh, the first reason they said it was there was for when these cars become fully autonomous and the robo taxi, you can monitor what's going on in the car. But recently it's been enabled to make sure you're paying attention when some of the driver assist features are enabled. So the seats are incredibly comfortable. I drive a Model 3, these seats feel much more comfortable to me. And for those of you that were worried, lumbar support uh, is here on both passenger and driver seats. Don't have any massaging functions or anything like that, but they are really comfortable seats. It's probably the most comfortable seats that Tesla's ever made. So comfort in the rear seat is pretty good. Um, the seats look like they're cool because they have the same perforated look as the front seats. They are not, they are heated though, uh, but certainly comfortable. So this is my seating position. I'm like an average height dude. Uh, I am 5'9". Uh, our cameraman and director who's helping make this video is 6'5". This is his seating position as if he was driving. Let me show you what that would look like. I could not sit here for any length of time. My knees are already hitting and they are all the way back. And I don't have any space underneath the seat to put my feet. That I think is a potentially a really big long-term problem. Um, if you're gonna try to get people in the car, you need shorter drivers. This is a very big sedan, but there is not a lot of rear passenger room. And that comes as a pretty big surprise. Um, can an adult sit in the middle seat? Yeah, there's, this feels bolstered out a lot more. It is not comfortable on the back, especially the lower back. You can see where my back is hitting the seats. 
Um, but I'd be more comfortable sitting here than I would be sitting in the passenger seat with somebody who's 6'5 sitting in front of me. Now, 6'5 is an extreme example. You know, somebody maybe is 6'2 or 6'3, um, but they're gonna be tight in the back, I think is a point that I'm, that I'm trying to make. The other things that are going on here in the rear seat that are in the rear that are new, so you can sit somebody here, obviously. Um, there's a button on the back to release this middle console. Uh, and you've got a couple things going on here. So obviously you have cup holders. Lift this up, you've got storage. Then you've got two wireless charging pads. But what's a bit weird about them, you put your phone there, this closes on top of it. So you can see or charge or at least see a bit of your phone, depending on what phone you're using. You can pull it out, but you can't see your phone while it's charging if you keep this closed. I have three kids, so for me to be able to consider a car, any car, it needs to be able to fit all three. Uh, two are in boosters, one are in a car seat. So, like pretty much every car, um, the two outer seats have the latch system, but what's weird is that it's really tight to get in there. They have to sort of open these little flaps up and then the latch is there, and if anybody's installed car seats, usually the latches are a lot bigger, so that's gonna end up stretching that pretty significantly. Let me show you what it looks like, though, uh, with car seats in the back. All right, so just for an example, here is a booster seat. Uh, a kid could sit here and have plenty of leg room, especially with my seating position, um, and somebody could still sit in the middle. Where you can see a problem though, if you've got somebody, you know, like Courtney 6'5", or like JD who's 6'5", you put a seat here, there's no way a kid can sit here with any leg room. And again, extreme example of 6'5", but even somebody who's 6'2", or 6 feet, it is going to be tight. You could fit three kids back here, but it would not be comfortable. So when these were first getting ready to ship, there were spy shots at the Fremont factory that looked like there was two extra seats in the back, making this a seven-seater. And he don't even hinted that maybe it could be possible. So let me just kind of put that to rest. If you open up the trunk, when the original Model S shipped, you could get two jump seats in the back. If we pick up this kind of bottom barrier, you still have sort of the hallmark of the Model S and any of the really Tesla's EVs, the sort of sub-trunk storage. You could probably fit folded seats back there, but none of the brackets or any of them are here, but no option to order this at all as a seven-seater. To fold the seats, these buttons are gigantic now, uh, and also you can fold them from the back. Still not power, all that does is going to release the seats. You still gotta go forward and push them down. So a hallmark of the Model S has been just an immense amount of storage in the back, the hatchback. Ton of room, that's here as well. Removable shelf comes out, it'll fold down, I actually put a decent amount of weight on here. Almost use it like a tray if you wanted to, I don't know, have a lunch or something. Um, this is still powered, obviously the back. What's still not powered though, is the front. All right, so that's the answer to a lot of questions. But the, the big questions that I had, the yoke steering wheel. Uh, it's better than I expected it to be. I still think it's not great and not as good as a regular round wheel, but it's definitely drivable and I would probably get used to it. I was surprised at how little the space was in the back, especially if you are, you're tall or your passenger is tall. So that was a little bit disappointing, but that's gonna depend on how you are going to use the car. I was crazy impressed with the performance of this thing. Zero to 60 in 3.1 seconds. And again, is the exact same performance spec, zero to 60 jaunt, as the Performance Model 3. And when you compare the long range to the Plaid, there's about a $45,000 price difference in there to save about a second uh, on the zero to 60 time. And I haven't driven the Plaid, I'm sure it feels amazing. This certainly feels like a better value, unless you have to have that extra performance. I liked everything about this car. I liked the way it drove, I liked the handling, I loved the performance. So right now, as the longest range Tesla you can get, and you're getting a car that can still very quickly get out of its own way and beat pretty much everything else out there that you might find on the freeway. Tesla built a really good car. It's not the perfect car. I wish you had the option to pick a yoke or a steering wheel and the user and the driver could sort of have that choice. But overall, I've been really pleased with my time with the Model S Long Range. If you were deciding whether or not to get one, I can't answer that question for you, but hopefully you're better equipped to answer that question for yourself.